afternoon. I'm Tom Lynch, uh, the President and Director of the Fred Hutch, and welcome to AIDS at 40, Remembering and Renewal. It's terrific to have all of you with us today for this remarkable hour when we're going to talk and, and reflect on what's happened over the past 40 years. On June 5th, the world will mark 40 years since the first five cases of what later became known as AIDS were officially reported. Uh, I remember quite well where I was in 1981, and I bet most of the people on this call remember where they were uh, in 1981 when this um, viral uh, disease was first identified. And it first came out in the U.S. Centers um, for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC's Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. And I remember as a was a, a medical student then, and I actually subscribed to the um, to the uh, Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, um, and uh, and that was the the first mention of this at that point. Well, we all know that that since that first uh, mention in MMWR, um, seventy million people have acquired HIV. Some were celebrities, and I, I find it kind of amazing that we're mentioning Rock Hudson since. You really do date yourself if you know who Rock Hudson was, uh, but uh, some were celebrities like Rock Hudson. He was one of the first to be public about his AIDS diagnosis. Uh, all, many more people know Magic Johnson, uh, who's one of the most popular uh, people living with HIV who's with us today. Um, and then others like Larry Kramer, whose anger helped to form the grassroots AIDS uh, coalition to unleash power or act up. Um, I, I remember... Uh, seeing Normal Heart um, uh, in New York at the Public Theater, it was one of the most moving theater experiences <clears throat> in my life. Um, by then, I was a a intern um, who was dealing with HIV and AIDS um, in the clinical environment, and I remember that that piece of theater was one of the most important pieces of theater I've ever seen. And I would say that similarly at that same time. Many of you remember the book and the band played on by Randy Schultz, which is also, again, something from the 80s that um, was able to describe in powerful detail the inadequacy of our initial response, HIV. We also know about Ryan White, a courageous young man who fought discrimination in his Indiana community and became a face of public education about the disease. So we know that about 35 million have died from AIDS. Uh, since the start of the pandemic, according to the WHO. And still, even though we've seen such great progress in the United States and the Western world, we still know that about a million people a year die from HIV. And in some countries, it's the leading cause of death. Today, we want to remember those who we've lost to HIV and honor those who live with HIV, who inspire us to work tirelessly to respond to this epidemic. We also want to take a moment today and remember Seattle na native Timothy Ray Brown, the first person to be cured of HIV, who was recently taken for us when his leukemia returned. Timothy's cure was a direct result of an experiment in Berlin using bone marrow transplantation, a clinical technique that was pioneered here at the Fred Hutch by Dr. E. Donald Thomas, who won the Nobel Prize in 1990 for his groundbreaking work. June 5th is also HIV Long-Term Survivors Awareness Day. Um, people who acquired HIV before the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy, or HEART, in 1996 are considered HIV long-term survivors. They now faced a host of medical, psychosocial, practical issues. Uh, they're associated with HIV stigma, uh, aging, ageism, and economic distress that impacts their quality of life. And so today, we want to celebrate the strength, the resilience of local people who have been living with HIV for decades. And from their example, renew ourselves and our vision to end HIV, everyone, everywhere. This still remains an incredibly important part of what we do here at the Fred Hutch. So it is our great fortune to have with us, and I am not certain if Pat was able to join us, so we either have two or we have three local HIV long-term survivors who have helped shape our, our national and our local response to HIV. So Bill Hall... So we have Bill and Tony with us. Bill Hall is a Klingit Indian from the Raven Clan from Southeast Alaska, a community advocate for the Native American community, as well as a longtime member 
of the Defeat HIV Community Advisory Board. He's also a member of the Equity and Research Community Advisory Board affiliated with Seattle Children's Hospital and a member of the 50 Strong and Healthy Group within the National Minority AIDS Council. We also are fortunate to have with us Tony Radovich, uh, who is a community activist who advocates for those living with HIV AIDS and substance abuse issues. He helped to found Strength Over Speed, a peer-to-peer -peer crystal meth recovery program for gay men in Seattle. These days, he helps to organize low and no income Washingtonians through his participation in Vocal Washington, Voices of Community Activists and Leaders. Bill and Tony, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your experiences. So I guess I want to start off by, you know, saying what does it mean to be a long-term survivor? Bill? And Bill, I believe you're still muted. Now you should be okay. Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, well, for me, being a long-term survival is just how uh, survivor is just how you defined it. Is I tested positive um, even before AIDS had a name, and. Um, <clears throat> It's been thinking a lot about this being the 40th anniversary of HIV, and it's a bittersweet memory. It's amazing that we've reached this stage, those of us who are still here, but it's also, you know, it, it's amazing that you know, at this, in this day and age, that over 36,000 people still contract HIV every year. So, um, I think that there's so much more work that we need to do. You're abs absolutely right. And, uh, uh, Tony, what was it like living through the early years? Can you think back? Uh, to the early years of your experience, and what, to, to remind people who may not have been there in the in the early to mid '80s, what was it like? Uh, thank you, Tom. I I think the the most profound thing that um, comes to my mind is uh, coming out of the sexual revolution, Tom, where uh, the only thing I had to worry about in regards to this, any sort of STI was going to the community clinic for a shot or a pill. And, and I think that so much around HIV and AIDS and the impact that it has, not only on me, but my community as well as the, the celebration in regards to freedom as uh, a gay and queer men, which is what, how I identify with myself. But, but it really was... Uh, a, a stop, like a full stop in regards to that celebration of self or celebration of community. And, and when you think about it, the, the intersection of those two big events, I think you've, you've identified as, as being so absolutely critical in the experience of so many of the uh, people who, who dealt with AIDS early uh, in that time. I think that really is, a, is incredibly important. Uh, to, to focus on uh, the timing of when that happened um, and how how difficult it was for people. Um, Bill, what what do you think helped you survive as long as you have? Um, I, you know, I, I keep back thinking back to my experience when I was working as a um, as a young attending at Mass General Hospital. I was a cancer doctor, and I remember I had a patient in the intensive care unit who had lung cancer. And next to the patient in the intensive care unit was a, was a, a man um, who was a very prominent radio commentator in, uh, in Boston uh, named, uh, uh, named David uh, Browdy. And he had uh, pneumocystis at the same time. And it turns out that, he's, that he survived pneumocystis and the next week heart got approved. And he was able to get effective antiretroviral therapy that allowed him um, to live. And, and I guess that not everybody has such a stark rush with death and then the availability of, of antiretroviral therapy. Bill, what do you think helped you do as well as you did? Well, 
that's been a question that I've struggled with for 40 years, and I think any long-term survivor will tell you that, you know, they went through um, severe survivor's guilt just because of the massive number of people around us that um, had died. I have lived four support groups. And it wasn't like five or seven people that were in our support group. It was 25 to 30 people in our support groups. And so um, I've never been able to come up with an answer to that question. You know, it's just something I think about every so often is why am I still here? And I have to think that it's what propelled me to become an advocate for HIV. And, and, and Tony, what's the hardest thing now uh, for you what, in, in being a long-term survivor? Um, and we're going to talk about your work in a second, both of you, but, but what's, what's the hardest part of it now um, that you're 40 years in? Oh, wow. Uh, a reacquainting of self, actually, in regards to an aging individual living with HIV. I have all the complications of an individual who's uh, my equivalent or, or my peer in other groups. And, and I think that um, understanding my body and its changes and are, are those related to HIV or are they just normal aging? body parts that are becoming wonky and and no longer working and and to some degree the limitations associated with that and understanding the the complexities around how i'm uh living as a person uh with hiv and yeah yeah and and you know both of you have done incredible work um in the community um bill can you talk about what inspired you to do this work and, and what the unmet needs that you're uh, trying to address? Well, it was really my involvement with the Feed HIV that really um, ignited that uh, desire in me to step forward and become an advocate for the Native American community. Um, it was through my involvement with Defeat HIV that I learned the reason Native Americans are the most underserved community with regards to HIV was that no one in the Native community was speaking up, and that bothered me. So when I heard about three women, Native women, who had contracted HIV, uh, that were so ashamed that they would be, if anybody found out, they would be disowned not only by their families, but by their communities as well. They never sought treatment, and because of this, they died. That really bothered me, and so when we were planning our first event, I decided to step forward. And 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 um, and when you when you think when you think about it, Tony, um, you've also done work um, on the intersection of substance use and HIV. Tell us a little bit about that, and and uh, and how that has evolved. Um, well, I, I I think I'd like to begin and um, share that I believe peers are the most underutilized resource in every community. I, uh, and that certainly was uh, reflective of my understanding almost 20 years ago where a group of us gay men who were coming out of uh, crystal meth addiction where we realized that there were gaps in services associated with a recovery and sustaining long-term recovery. But, but what does recovery mean? Recovery means different things for everybody. And I think creating a container or an environment that is really supportive of an individual's self-directed life towards that definition for themselves is, is creating a healthy 
uh, a place for um, other considerations in regards to behavior change. And so with uh, help from community, and I think that's an essential comp component is, um, um, uh, Tom, it goes to my belief that my, my community heals me every time. And so um, how, how can we um, support one another in regards to our uh, journey of recovery? But in the intersections with HIV, Tom, I think it's really important to say is that conversations around HIV and, and adherence to medications and, and the, the importance of U equals U and, and then um, um, using my privilege and uh, leveraging my power and influence, how do I address the gaps and use my voice to articulate the needs in other communities? And I think that's, that's one of the things that I've really found myself uh, in these days. Yeah, and, and, and Bill, what lessons have you learned that you'd want to share with, with the new generation that, that may be dealing with HIV now? Um, knowing that we're close to vaccines, we're close to curative drug treatments, but we don't have a cure or a way of preventing HIV completely at this point that is widely accessible, um, and we're still on that cusp of there of getting it. So, so AIDS is still a chronic disease in, in in at this point. What would you share with someone who is diagnosed now um, psychologically, emotionally, to help them? Well, I think that uh, what I shared at the beginning of this epidemic was support, support, support. And, you know, we've come so far, it just amazes me when I think about where we've come from, how far we've come. And, um, you know, we're actually at a point where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, I think support continues to be a major, uh, what's the word, it's, you need support, you need to talk through uh, what you're dealing with, and support is what helps get you through the day. And Tony, the last question I have for you is, we're in the midst of another epidemic now, in addition to HIV, which is COVID. Um, what's similar, what's different between COVID and HIV? I'm sure this is something you've thought a lot about for the past year and a half. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, uh, well, I, I think that what, what's more prescient now is I'm... I'm um, and through conversations with individuals within my peer group is coming out of isolation. And I think so much around HIV and the history of HIV and even my own experience, there are ways in regards isolation sort of fueled not only my addiction, but fueled um, my withdrawal from community. And now with the relaxing of measures in regards to communities opening up as a result of vaccinations, is that there's an individual assessment of risk associated with comfort level, one's own comfort level. And I think that so much reflects the, uh, the uh, epidemic in the beginning is that we had to look at our risks. We had to look at our behaviors. Um, our interactions with community and the importance of community and our community health. I, I, and so much of that is reflective in regards to COVID-19 and our agreements in regards to community health practices. So, um, so it's interesting to see all of that sort of play out, Tom. Yeah, it is. And, and Bill and Tony, I want to thank you for being with us today and for all you're doing to make our community healthier. Um, your courage and example are really terrific. So thank you both for joining us today. It's been terrific to have you. I now want to bring on Dr. Larry Corey. Um, we're going to hear from Larry Corey and George Counts. Larry, first, um, everyone knows that thanks to today's antiretroviral treatment, people can live longer than ever. Uh, we knew back in 87, uh, AZT was the first uh, medicine that was approved uh, for HIV, and numerous other medications have become available 
and are now used together in, in, um, in heart uh, treatment for this. Um, it's made a huge difference in how this, uh, this uh, epidemic has, has um, played out. And um, we know that when taken consistently, uh, when heart is taken consistently, a person living with HIV becomes undetectable and has zero chance of giving the virus to another person through sex. And they've named this phenomenon U equals U, which stands for undetectable equals untransmittable. Many of the people who played a huge role in development of anti-HIV therapy are here in Seattle. And Larry Corey is one of them who's been incredibly important. Larry's an internationally renowned expert in virology. He was the former president and director of the Fred Hutch. His research focuses on herpes virus, HIV, the novel coronavirus. <clears throat> there are a few viruses uh, that Larry has not had an important impact. He's also one of the founding fathers of, anti of antiviral chemotherapy and the first investigator to use a cyclovir uh, for genital herpes. And he first used it um, uh, on first to demonstrate that the use um, on a daily basis could suppress infection and transmission to the sexual partner. He was also, in 1987, the first chair of the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, which made an enormous difference in the progression of this uh, pandemic. In the mid-90s, he turned his attention to viral immunology, and in 1999, he founded the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, or the HVTN, which is so important here at the Fred Hutch and globally. Um, there are 16 countries on five continents that participate in Larry's study. Larry, uh, in March of 2000, uh, of, uh, uh, Larry was asked by Tony Fauci to direct the HVTN um, and um, and to uh, and and to be able to to work on COVID vaccines, and it became the CoVPN. So the story is very similar for Larry in these two in these two areas. So I, if we can bring Larry on, I don't see him on the screen. Doesn't mean he's not there, um, but I don't see Larry on the screen. Larry, are you there? I I am here. I don't know what's the story with the video here, but um... okay. Well, well, we'll 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 work on that. And so, Larry, tell tell us a little bit about the similarities between COVID and HIV, and how you got involved um, uh, in both of these efforts, and what you see as being similar, and what's different between the two pandemics. Um, I, I think that actually the pandemics are uh, on an epi basis obviously different, but you know when HIV came, um, uh, you still had the you you had the issue of the stigmatization of the population that was associated with this, and um, and we really weren't organized in, in any way. I mean, for for myself, who was running, who was the virologist for the Northwest, and also had worked um, uh, with antiretrovirals, with antivirals, the first one. So when we developed the AIDS clinical trials group, we essentially established a network to try and speed clinical development, um, and um, it was very similar to the COVPN in the sense of calling the academic investigators in the United States, getting together, and trying to do our best to actually. Um, develop the technologies, work with pharmaceutical companies to actually develop therapies for, for HIV. Uh, took a little while to get us organized. Of course, at, uh, at that point in time, Bros. Welcome had done a cyclovir. They also uh, did a screening compound and came up with AZT. And, and nucleoside chemistry started to mature at that point in time. Um, we went through this issue of, um, uh, of Using d developing the concepts that we could uh, use the viral replication as a surrogate marker. We did viral load. Um, it was my lab that actually isolated HIV very early on um, in, in, our, in a cohort that we had established in Seattle with the gay lymphadenopathy syndrome. We cultured the virus from, from um, the vir virus from the blood at that point in time. It was logical to start earlier therapy. We did that with Paul Voberding um, and the ACTG with um, um, ACTG uh, 116, give it earlier. And we started adding combination drugs. Pharmaceutical industry started coming up with new targets uh, other than nucleosides. We had two nucleosides, and then we had the protease inhibitors. Um, and we then started to develop the, uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy. If you look at that, it was four years. During those four years, I led the, um, um, the, the ACTG. Uh, we went from single therapy to triple therapy to highly active antiretroviral therapy. And first protease inhibitor, the quinagrevir, was not very good, but the indinavir added it, and all of a sudden we were getting suppression. And we changed this from 
um, a disease in which every person, every um, HIV infected person I took to the medical school classes at the University of Washington had passed on um, by the next class. Um, and now we were able to, to sort of see people gain weight and, and do the remarkable um, benefits that we've seen of, um, of antiretroviral therapy. And sorry, can you comment on the, on the benefit of combination therapy uh, from a cancer perspective? Some of our greatest successes have been in combination therapies for breast cancer, for Hodgkin's disease. Um, you know, we cure Hodgkin's disease, we cure lymphomas, we cure leukemias by combining drugs together. And, and you've done some of that same work in, in HIV. Um, can you tell us a little bit about combination therapy and, and, um, and how you got to the, uh, what allowed you to, to go so fast? The one thing that many of us in the cancer world were envious of was how incredibly fast you were able to go from a single drug to three drug combinations. What were the key ingredients that made that happen? I think the on the biological basis was being able to develop surrogate mar markers. It was first just viral load culture, and then we were able to develop nucleic, nucleic acid testing and using PCR um, and RNA PCR to to look at that. And though you would then be able to use the viral load marker as uh, you know at the moment that was the quote it's the virus stupid um, was sort of you know sort of you know let's use the viral load as a marker of you know adding another drug adding another drug and seeing that wow, we could get it below detectable level. I think the other important issue was um, that we were able to rapidly enroll clinical trials. We had a very high participation rate by the HIV-infected community into clinical trials, higher than we see in cancer. Um, and that's an interesting issue as to what happened there. Um, I do think that the best care was given. Uh, there weren't any options. No one was, you know, had different kinds of, of, quote, standard therapy. There was no standard therapy. And so there was a, an ability to actually, uh, you know, rapidly enroll the clinical trials. Not quite as, as, as like we have done in COVID, where, where it's on a population basis. But on a relative population basis, I think we got incredible participation uh, of the MSN community um, in the United States uh, into these uh, uh, clinical trials. And in our first um, pediatric trial, uh, or the first maternal fetal transmission of AZT from maternal mom, mother to uh, infant transmission, um, ACTG076, we again got very high participation from the um, uh, from mothers in the United States, the Black African community in New York, and our other uh, southern uh, cities who rapidly enrolled the trial and participated in the trial. Yeah, and Larry, one of the things that you did with ACGG, and I think you've also done it with CoVPN, is the importance of getting community members into clinical research. Can you talk a little bit about that, about how how you did that, um, and 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 why you what made you see that so early in the game? Because that became a big game changer for you, both in HIV and in COVID. Well, I'd say it's a two you know a, 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 a two part story here. Um, yes. You're a physician. Yes, you've worked with stigmatized diseases. I started a patient advocacy organization in, in herpes. But in HIV, it was different. It, you know, Larry Kramer was, um, had Mark Harrington and Peter Staley. They were very vocal. Um, and they were at us as an investigators. And so it, there, there was certainly a, a, a desire to do this. But, you know, it was also um, a, tar a hard time, um, you know, uh, in the sense of, um, knowing that you were a physician, seeing people on the wards, teaching the humanity of, of, of HIV, but yet being criticized that you weren't doing things fast enough. You were the face of the research organization that wasn't, quote, in their minds, doing it quite right or um, doing it fast enough. And a lot of that was public support. Now, um, you know, I would say I worked, this is where my relationship with Tony was. We were both criticized, um, but yet um, we were doing the best we could. Um, you can reflect and say um, there's a lot of right that the community did that we needed to work faster. And we did incorporate them and we put them on um, committees and put them in the beginning of research. And they weren't just tokens. They actually, you know, created um, ways of doing clinical research and the ways of dealing with consent forms and, and community outreach to get buy-in on trials that you really could see that this was the right way to act. And I think that that was a lessons learned that I've carried throughout my life. And um, 
you know, I, I think out of criticism, you sort of reflect a little bit and and look at what's what you know what uh, you can learn from that. And I think we built that into the HVTN, and we certainly have built that into the CoVPN um, community education program that we have you know really made a difference in in getting minority communities. It's that twenty years of work that went in building community. And, and Larry, thank you very much. Thanks for participating in this program. Thanks for your leadership of the Hodge. Thanks for your leadership of the ACTG. Thanks for your leadership of the CoVPN. The impact you have made in, in health globally is absolutely extraordinary. So thank you again for being with us today. Um, we'll now transition to Dr. George Counts. Dr. Counts was formerly Senior Advisor on Special Populations for the HIV Vaccine Trials Network here at the Hutch. He's held faculty positions at the University of Miami in Florida and the University of Washington, where he became a professor of medicine. He held several positions at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, including Chief of the Clinical Research Management Branch in the Division of AIDS, and then the Director of Research on Minority and Women's Health at the NIAID. An inspiring advocate for diversity and gender equity in the field of infectious diseases, he was a recipient of the 2020 Walter E. Stam Mentor Award. Welcome, uh, Dr. Counts, uh, to have you with us today. Um, so you have said that the most important contribution you've made to HIV uh, were the five years at NIAID when you set up and ran the Clinical Research Management Branch. Why do you say that? Thank you. Good morning, Tom. As Larry just described, I got involved in uh, the AIDS fight, mid 80s, mid to late 80s. And Larry described what the climate was like during those years. And my colleagues know what it was like. The advocates were protesting violently because people were dying and there was appeared to be nothing being done. So as he said, they petitioned both the Food and Drug Administration to do more efficient petition the scientists to do more. So that was the climate in which I got involved with HIV AIDS in the late 80s. I was contacted in the in late 88 by Maureen Myers, who along with John LaMontagne had set up the idea of the clinical trials network. I got involved and came aboard in the mid-1989. I joined the Division of AIDS to work with Maureen Myers and Dan Hoth, and my role was to set up and run the, the Clinical Research Management Branch, or CRUM as we called it, and it was its purpose was to provide the logistical support for the clinical trials that were getting, getting underway at the time. Larry mentioned the ACT was, ACT, ACTG was formed and was launching multi-center clinical trials to look at the possibilities that AZT and possibly other drugs would be effective against HIV. So that was the circumstance under which we launched CROM's involvement with the ACTG. There were about 30 ACTUs or AIDS clinical trials units scattered across the U.S. and Puerto Rico, adult and pediatric sites, and in Crom, we had five site administrators who worked closely with all of these ACTUs. They provided administrative support. They worked with grants management. They helped uh, pay for performance system where there could be increased enrollment, especially for minority subjects. They helped them work with prepare supplemental grant requests. They helped them do performance re performance reviews. That was an issue. How do you manage, how do you measure the effectiveness of a particular site in a multi-center clinical trials program? We use the ACTG as a model and de and developed a tool that might help with that. Well, the site inspectors also work with areas to focus on minority enrollment, working with the HBCTUs, for example. So. And there was direct involvement with the pharmaceutical companies. What I am describing is a network of people working with the individual sites so that they could conduct and perform high quality clinical research or potential 
potential AIDS drugs. So ultimately, as Larry said, over this four-year period, first one drug was found to be effective, then combinations, and then finally it led to a few couple of years later with heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy. So I left the, AC, the Division of AIDS in 1994, and in looking back, I was very proud of what the ACDG accomplished in that period. I was also proud of what my what role my colleagues in CROM played in making it a reality. And so, George, can you tell me what and when you knew that HIV antiretrovirals worked? What was the moment that you heard, you saw data, or you heard a report, <clears throat> or when was the moment? Oh my gosh, we've really done something here. Um, I know in my own career, when I've had a chance to impact things, I can remember the moment that it dawned on me, ah, oh, we're going to help people. When did it dawn on you that, that antiretroviral therapy was going to change the course of this pandemic? As um, an infectious disease physician, in the late 80s, I was involved at in the University of Washington as an academic infectious disease person, but I was also providing infectious diseases consultation uh, to the bone marrow transplant program at the, Fred, at the Fred Hutchinson. And when I was aware of AIDS and what it's devastating was doing to the community, and in 1987, it was reported that AZT, this drug, might be effective and at that point, the significance of what a drug that might work to, for this terrible epidemic going on was like, you know, it was like a breath of fresh air. Would it become a reality? Because we were all reading the newspaper, hearing about friends, colleagues, and acquaintances who were getting sick and dying from AIDS. So at that point, in, in 87, when AZT was rec recognized, it became hope, a hope to me. Okay. And George, do you think vaccines will work eventually for HIV? Well, in 2002, I came back to Seattle. Larry had organized the HVTN and was conducting uh, vaccine research around the world, with clinical trials around the world. And also, as he mentioned, it had a heavy input of community engagement. So I had gotten interested in bioethics. Um, I had studied at the program at NIH with Zeke Emanuel and Christine Grady, and I had taken a bioethics program at Georgetown. So there were two things about the VTN that was of great interest to me. One, how you conduct high quality clinical trials that are appropriately uh, bioethically sound in developing countries around the world. I was interested in that. And the second thing was an opportunity to work with Wakefield and the community engagement program because they were, they were looking at how to get more minorities and others involved in our ACTUs here in Seattle. So, I joined the VTN with, with those objectives in mind. And the question would be, if we are successful, okay, and obviously at the Hutch we're working really hard to come up with an HIV vaccine. Right. If we are successful, okay, do you think you'll see the same kind of hesitancy to take the vaccine that we're seeing with the COVID vaccine right now? As an infectious disease doctor, how do you grapple with that? As Yes, a simple answer is certainly I believe that there will be vaccine hesitancy. But I'm, I'm Pollyannish. I thought that 15 years ago, the VTN and the colleagues and scientists around the world would have, would have developed an HIV vaccine. Little did I know about the complexities of the virus and the difficulties that it would take to actually get a vaccine. But think about it. We, we say to the community, year after year after year, that expectation that there will be an HIV vaccine. You know, we're, we're working on it. And I think the longer that we go on trying to develop a vaccine, 
uh, some persons will certainly begin to say that maybe this isn't for me. The same hesitancy that we see now with the COVID vaccine, maybe there's more to it. Um, maybe they're telling us stuff that that they don't want us to know. And those all those sorts of hesitancies that are appear, yes, there will be vaccine hesitancy. Yeah. And, and that's why I think, you know, some of your work to get marginalized people or specialized populations into this research is so incredibly important. Really makes a difference. But it looks at, it's a reflection of the broader world of getting women and minorities involved in research. I mean, going back to early 1993, when the NIH uh, Vitalization Act was passed, in part because congressional women pushed to get more women involved in research, in funded research, because they were not participating in the drugs, the drug trials. So it wasn't clear that the drugs were safe and effective, yet when drugs were licensed, everyone was treated. So that gave the push to get more minorities and women involved. NIH launched a, gui a guideline on the uh, inclusion of women and minorities in research. But you look back now, 15 years later, how much has been accomplished? How much have we accomplished being able to get M marginalized population, any populations involved in clinical research? And the answer, we have not been very successful. In 2013, a look at over 10,000 clinical trials funded by NCI showed that less than 2% met the minority criteria that NIH set. So we, there is a great need for getting women and minorities involved in clinical research, but we are not yet meeting our goals. Uh, Dr. Counts, thank you for everything you've done in your career to get us to where we are today, and, and uh, thank you for being such an important part of the fact that we're able to talk about these successes. It's, it's very, very much appreciated, and uh, you serve as an important role model to all of us, so thank you. Um, thank you. We'll next move on to Dr. Stefan Wallace, uh, Jason Plourd, and Rosette Royale. We're going to be coming on. Um, <clears throat> so the HIV response has come a long way since the disease was discovered in 1981. Antiretroviral therapy was a, a major milestone that, that changed uh, the lives of millions of people who've had this. Um, and this ability to allow people to achieve an undetectable viral load um, makes it impossible to transmit the virus to their partners and has, has changed the lives of so many people. But now we're focused, as I mentioned earlier with Larry and, 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 uh, and George, um, we're focused on finding a cure for HIV. And can we find a cure in that point? Uh, another big major milestone in 2012 was the approval of pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, uh, which taken every day can protect people from acquiring HIV through sex or through drug use. However, as people know, the cost of PrEP is an important concern. Even in the United States, um, these are expensive drugs. And so therefore, the idea of a vaccine um, that we could use has incredible appeal. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Stefan Wallace in so many different places, um, mostly in CoVPN. Um, and um, Stefan's a research epidemiologist and an expert in developing, implementing, and evaluating uh, public health and human service programs in the area of prevention and treatment of HIV AIDS and of other diseases globally, including COVID. <clears throat> He's director of external relations of both the HIV vaccine trials network and the COVID-19 prevention network. Dr. Wallace leads the network's external relations strategies and efforts globally with a focus on building long-term relationships with key uh, stakeholders. So Stefan, welcome um, for being here today. Very much appreciated. What, as, as you have said, and, and having done so much in your career on these two very important pandemics, um, what do you think, where do you think we're going to be in terms of HIV prevention and preventing the disease from spreading? What, what's your hope and dream of what we can accomplish? Well, obviously a vaccine would be uh, optimal. Uh, and a vaccine that was able to protect people around the world from various strands of HIV and that was accessible 
um, would be optimal. But I also know that there are people out there who desire lots of options, you know, options. The menu of options is a constant conversation in communities. And so also thinking about other strategies like um, long acting injectable prep, which is uh, potentially forthcoming, um, microbicides, um, and uh, new strategies regarding treatment, uh, including long acting treatment strategies, as, and of course, uh, a cure. And, and, and Dr. Wallace, you and I have done a lot of programs for different communities about uh, COVID, and we've had a chance to talk a lot about it. And one of the questions that we get asked almost all the time when we do these programs. I'm going to ask you the question now so you can struggle with it. Um, you've done really well creating a vaccine for COVID, okay? You guys have been working for 25 years on a vaccine for HIV and we, we're not there yet. Why did we make a COVID vaccine in about, I don't know, two months? Two months to make it and then another eight months to test it. And we've been at this for 20 years and we haven't come up with the HIV vaccine. What's the big difference between these two viruses that makes a vaccine so hard for HIV and so much better for COVID? Yeah, well, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a, is a simpler virus to uh, address. It's a virus that we've had quite a bit of experience with in other areas, including SARS and MERS. And the vaccine development process that we utilized to respond to that particular virus has been um, utilizes efforts and knowledge that we've taken from other areas, including HIV. Um, and, you know, to answer you a little bit more directly, HIV is a much more complicated virus to respond to. Uh, the genetic diversity of HIV alone makes it much more challenging and complicated. Um, in addition to the fact that HIV attacks the very cells that are designed to coordinate the immune response and protect the body. Um, of course, we know that HIV can also hide from the immune system, uh, which complicates uh, the process. And we also know that we need to have the right kind of immune response that is rapid and broad. Um, and this has been one of the challenges with getting a vaccine. And Stefan, how close are we getting either a, if you had to predict, how close are we to getting a vaccine for HIV and how close are we getting to getting a drug cure? I liked your idea of how we need multiple, we need multiple fronts in this battle. How close are those to happening? Well, I, you know, the long acting strategies, uh, you know, there's some, some work happening there, some submissions to FDA and some reviews happening there. Uh, with respect to a vaccine, I, I will continue to say that we learn new things with each trial and we will continue to work on this and that it's hopefully soon. Um, we've learned a lot about what doesn't work as well as what potentially could work. Um, and we've also done some what I like to call reverse engineering of trying to really figure out what is the right kind of immune response that's needed. Um, by doing some monoclonal antibody trials to, to sort of help figure that out. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get there. And are there things beyond biomedical approaches that we need help end HIV? Absolutely. Um, we need increased research um, and interventions that are focused on structural and policy factors that make uh, acquiring HIV more likely. Um, housing and poverty are examples. We need increased research and interventions that are focused on building community level capacity to respond to HIV and other health conditions that, um, that are not necessarily centered in academic spaces. We also need to address and dismantle all the systems of oppression that impact communities differentially. Um, racism, sexism, trans and homophobia and antagonisms, ableisms uh, are just to name some. And of course, uh, I, I often say that HIV and its impact to me are really symptoms of larger societal issues. Um, and some of the hesitancy that Dr. Council was speaking to um, relates to some of this as well. When I think about medical racism, the medical establishment needs to do I think a better job of, of building better relationships with communities and resolving the bias that exists in systems that perpetuate
perpetuate um, negative experiences and, and social isolation for communities that lead to increased um, negative health outcomes, including HIV. So, Dr. Wallace, thank you for everything you do at the Hutch. You make the Hutch a better place, and you make our world a better place. And thank you for, uh, for everything you do, both in COVID and in HIV. So I'd like to now transition to the AMP. So AIDS was known, named, and linked to gay men by the time the first case received attention in Seattle in November of 82. In 1983, the city council promptly set aside funds, AIDS treatment and research, becoming the second city in the United States to do so. Um, the story of AIDS is a story of dignity, social justice, humanity, and the thousands of people who fell, fought, and provided care and comfort. The AMP is the AIDS Memorial Pathway. Born out of a desire to recognize the AIDS crisis in Seattle and throughout Washington State and our community's response um, to that crisis. And we have with us two staff members from AMP, the project manager Jason Plourd and Rosette Royale, the story collection and engagement uh, consultant. And we have a video um, that we are going to be able to show. And I believe we're going to show this first and then talk what it looks like. There was a funeral a week, if not more. I lost a lot of, of very, very close friends. For people of like my generation, it was a plague. The AIDS Memorial Pathway is a place of reflection and remembrance that also is going to utilize technology to tell stories about HIV and AIDS and the history within our region. Also provide a call to action to end HIV AIDS and stigma and discrimination. It's an effort to use public art and storytelling to talk about what the plague was like, how Seattle reacted to it, and remember people that died. The AIDS Memorial Pathway is going to be on Capitol Hill in Seattle. It's uh, around the light rail station and also the north edge of Cal Anderson Park. So many people have been impacted deeply by the virus. So memorializing those stories helps us to create a broad picture to have a more accurate panoramic view of how the virus has impacted many people in this region. If you had an AIDS diagnosis in the late 80s, you had one to two years to live. Seattle and King County became a model for the rest of the country. We set up this thing that we called the Continuum of Care, and there were services for people from education about HIV all the way to end-of-life care. No other city in the country was as coordinated. One of the things that I like about the AIDS Memorial Pathway is that it's incorporating different artist perspectives. I'm the story gathering consultant for the AIDS Memorial Pathway, and that means I go out and interview people and collect their stories talking about HIV AIDS. They told me in 1990, I think it was 94, that I was positive. History is vast, and this virus is vast, and the, its impacts on people have been vast. It's also a symbolic way of talking about a pathway of what we've experienced and being able to look back and see where we've been to kind of take stock of where we are now and to see a pathway for the future. I think that this is about looking at how we deal with a crisis and what are the ways uh, the best ways for us to respond to any crisis. We want to create a, a place to honor the people that died. We want to commemorate um, what King County and Seattle did that made them a model. And we want to talk about the fact that it's not over. That is, that is a fantastic video and a wonderful description of the uh, AIDS Memorial Pathway. Rosette and Jason, congratulations on this work. And, and Pat, looks like you're visiting us intermittently today. Uh, great to see you as well. So I guess the question I would have for Rosette is, um, uh, tell us about the memorial. Where does it stand? What's the progress of it right now? Where does it stand today? 
You know, actually, I'm going to let Jason answer that part, if you don't mind, Jason. Sure. Jason's a project um, manager, so we'll... Yeah, um, so two things. One is the project overall is going really well. Um, we've we've received wide support. Hundreds of people have donated and been involved in, in making it happen. And, uh, and we're going to have a dedication at the end of June, which we'll talk more about. Um, one of the things, I want to take the opportunity while Pat is here, one of the things that has been a, a, you know, a main uh, impetus and, and goal for the AMP is to collect stories from our communities. So to really um, listen to the folks who have been impacted most directly by HIV and AIDS, and Rosette did an amazing job of reaching out to these communities and collecting those stories. One of the first groups that w that he connected with was Babes, um, and it was Pat Migliori who really made that connection and helped us to, to get those stories um, so that we're not like looking at one narrative, but we're really allowing for broad narratives. And Pat, do you want to talk about like um, your involvement, you know, your support of the, the AMP, but also just like what you've done with Babes and how you've worked to get um, perspectives that have been overlooked in the, the history to be seen? Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, good afternoon now, I suppose. Um, and I apologize for being in and out. Sometimes you have to hold your phone way over your head in the fr front yard to get reception. Um, and um, when I became positive, there was the, one of the things that there was no support for women. Basically, uh, there were there was Seattle AIDS support group. They were very nice people, um, but they were primarily diagnosed a uh, long term survivor, which at that point I think was two years. Um, mothers groups. So that that was. Um, um, one place where people could get support, but it was pretty clear that we didn't have a lot of support for women, and women were really being overlooked early on in the epidemic, um, sometimes considered just vectors. And so when I found a few positive women, we started to get together socially, and we became Babes Network. Um, and Babes does not stand for anything, um, except we were babes before AIDS, and we're still babes. And um, we got together, and it was it was difficult to to find funding for a f women's organization. But we f found it, and we're still around today. Um, and I think that one of the I have really appreciated that AMP is doing the uh, has done so many interviews with individuals who have different kinds of backgrounds. Um, it's it's not all the same person, um, and so I I'm glad that we were at Babe we were able to help to put that together. So Pat, I want to thank you. Um, I'm going to give the last word in 20 seconds to Rosette. Uh, we are at 40 years. Did you think we were going to get here? And what are the next 40 years going to be like in 20 seconds? <laughs> all right. I uh, oh. Well, I hoped we would be here. I hope we would be in, in many other places too, right? But, and I'm going to allude to something that Tony Radovich said at the beginning, you know, he talked about peer support, peer and peer, and this word has come up uh, numerous times, community, right? And I really believe it's community that has brought us here to this place, where we're able to look back at this really difficult time and think about the grief, but also to think about the hope that was instilled in people and the hope that's still alive in people. And I think sort of being with each other in community, helping to support each other, to love each other, to care for each other, and to hold each other in the hard times has really brought us to this place where we're able to say, hey, there's this memorial on Capitol Hill. It is there as a place where people can go and reflect upon what happened here in the city and in the communities. And also think about where do we go from here? You know, one of the great things about uh, what Pat was talking about with Babes is that when I first started, really some of the first interviews happened at a retreat for for Babes. And so it's an organization for women living with HIV, and they let me go to this event. So that just shows the openness and the community support that happens when we all come together and help each other tell this story. And what a fantastic way to end today's uh, session. Jason, Rosette, Pat, thank you so much for your generosity of spirit, for being here, for everything you're doing 
um, to advance the health of people in Seattle and, and our community. I want to thank all of you for being with us today. I think we can quite simply say that the, um, the uh, progress we've made against AIDS, one of the most important advances in medicine uh, ever in the history of humanity, but we're not finished. We certainly haven't gotten all the way where we need to go. And so we will continue with the Fred Hutch to work hard at ways of preventing HIV, um, of curing HIV, and making life better for people who are living with HIV. And I want to thank all of you for a fabulous symposium and uh, wish you uh, uh, peace uh, in the rest of the day. Thank you.